Neon Leon Spinks was the last undisputed heavyweight champion after his upset over Muhammad Ali in 1978. He was immediately stripped by the WBC for refusing to fight as mandatory, but it may have been deeper than that. Spinks' mandatory was Ken Norton, a Don King fighter, and quiet as it was kept, there was a silent narrative to get the title off the aging Ali and move on from the iron grip he had on the sport. Spinks choosing to rematch Ali must have been a real slap in the face of the alleged collusion between King and the WBC. In return, they spit in his face, allegedly, of course, by granting Norton the title without the need to win it via a fight. The WBC insisted that Norton was made champion by a retroactive decision dating back to him beating Jimmy Young. Whatever the case, Norton and another Don King fighter Larry Holmes went on to have one of the greatest heavyweight title bouts of all time. From here, the WBC title saw stability in the reign of Holmes up until he was stripped of the title over financial reasons for refusing to fight Greg Page. Holmes would turn his attention to the relatively new sanctioning body, IBF, and become its inaugural champion, immediately skyrocketing its credibility. He would defend the title three times before dropping it to Michael Spinks in 1985. Spinks would win the rematch and host a successful defense against Jerry Cooney before being stripped for refusing to fight mandatory Tony Tucker. Tucker would win the vacant strap in a tough 10 round TKO over James Buster Douglas. Three months later, he would run into the 1980s heavyweight of destiny and give him his toughest fight. But what of the WBA title? It saw the opposite of stability, as a different man held it almost every year up until 1986. The lineage from Spinks is as follows. Ali would win it back from Spinks and retire the next year. The vacant title was then decided by a four-man tournament of which Big John Tate would be the winner in the final notable bout of the 1970s. Tate would go on to lose the title in a late shocker against Mike Hercules Weaver in 1980. Weaver would go on to lose the title to Michael Dynamite Dokes in 1982. Dokes would fall to Jerry Katsia in 1983. Tate would drop the strap to Greg Page in 1984. Page would lose to Tony Tubbs in 1985. And in 1986, Terrible Tim Witherspoon would take the title from Tubbs and lose it later in the year to James Bone Crusher Smith. For whatever reason, unification was never achieved in this seven year span. But most observers knew deep down, whether they liked the shadow champion or not, that Larry Holmes was the best of the best. He was the spiritual undisputed champion, at least until the heavyweight world series would play host to the birth of boxing's newest megastar and face, the man to finally succeed, Muhammad Ali, in the hearts of the fans. Oh, and as mentioned earlier, Francesco Damiani became the inaugural WBO champion in 1989. He held the title until 1991, when merciless Ray Mercer broke his nose for the knockout. Don King is alleged to have stiffed many fighters on their financial earnings. By 1983, his monopoly on the division included both titleists and most contenders, of which was a growing list. He ensured he'd walk in and out with the winner, regardless of the fight result. His supposed dictatorship meant the fighters moved according to his wishes, like pawns in a game. They trained, did publicity, fought, and got paid as Don demanded. Allegedly. Don had his own version of professional wrestling here, writing the whole damn show. The following is a speed round of the major alleged victims from the 80s heavyweight division alone. 
After splitting with Don in 1983, Larry Holmes took to focusing on making up money as opposed to competition and openly said he wasn't interested in, nor did he need a unification bout. Him saying that only the public wanted such a thing only served to further diminish his reputation. His chasing of the green shaped his decision to accept the IBF title, leading to its legitimacy. After benefiting from King treatment by losing his title and getting a shot at the other, Terrible Tim Witherspoon was allegedly stiffed of 50% of his money. His next fight saw his purse go from $500,000 to $90,000, allegedly. Not a man on this planet would be motivated to work his hardest while feeling like a slave, and Witherspoon can't be blamed for falling off. His physique became more flabby with each fight, culminating in his being obliterated by Bone Crusher Smith in his next bout. Tim couldn't be bothered to care about anything else other than his relief that he was rid of Don King. He sued the promoter for $25 million shortly after and would never again receive a title shot. Before he signed with King, Pinklin Thomas never even sniffed the title scene, despite his perfect record. After losing in his first defense, Thomas lost himself in drugs before beating his addiction at the turn of the decade. Of course, King was nowhere to be found when his former champion needed him most. Dynamite Dokes looked up to Don King like a father, but was treated like a stepchild when he found himself in trouble with the IRS. King, with his visible assets of a mansion and millions of dollars, turned Dokes away. Dokes, among the trouble he would get into, became suicidal. As with Terrible Tim, Greg Page's physique could be spotted flabbing out during his championship tenure under King. He admitted to buying a gun just to empty its clip into King. Page had a tragic ending to be covered in part seven, and during the final stretch of his life, unable to talk, Page scribbled on paper that Don King stole all of his money. Among the five listed were also Leon Spinks, Trevor Burbick, Bone Crusher Smith, Tex Cobb, Tony Tubbs, Mike Tyson, and Muhammad Ali himself. Tyson's war with King occurred more so in the 90s and Ali's more so in the 70s. Don King has been the subject of many allegations, but nothing has ever really stuck. Is he a crook or is he misunderstood as the scapegoat for the bad choices of the generation? Believe what you choose. Ultimately, Mike Tyson vanquished King's pawns and became the monopoly. Logically, King moved in on Kid Dynamite, and the rest is history. With such confusion afoot, it may have become easier to welcome the dismissal of boxing as a sport. 